Today we find ourselves in, uh, in a level of complexity that systems and subsystems, they're all dependent, they're interdependent, and sometimes the smallest problem can wreak great havoc. So what we're dealing with today is critical loads. And I've defined a critical load as any load that has the potential to cause a loss of output or revenue, these are expensive, due to unscheduled downtime, should it fail. Also, when a load failure presents a danger to people, animals, or property, it's also a critical load. What this webinar isn't, there's some beautiful preventative and predictive maintenance programs in the market today, and they're great. And, and I think that they should be used everywhere. However, they're not 100%. And this webinar is about minimizing the damage when you do have a critical load failure. Time is everything. So let's take a look at what downtime is all about. Downtime is very expensive. For instance, according to Gartner, a, a global research company, average cost of downtime in a data center is $5,600 per minute. Per minute, that's, that's astonishing to me. And data centers, they don't have an exclusive on this. It impacts industries across the board and infrastructure, whether it's municipalities, whether it's water, uh, power generation, it's, it's, it's very expensive. For instance, look at um, typical mining. You know, when a mine isn't operating, uh, it's costing up to $180,000 per incident. That's incredible to me. And most of these can be prevented with obviously the right processes, but also with the right solutions. So let's look at some examples. Data centers. Data centers are, are, are huge in the world, are huge in the United States, and they garner a lot of attention. And we have a number of solutions for data centers. And some of the things that can bring a data center down are, are simple things. Cooling pumps, fume extractors, generator batteries, uh, the heating and air units all very important, very small pieces of a puzzle, but very important. Manufacturing, we could list pages and pages and pages of critical loads, depending on the manufacturing facility. Switch gears a little bit, look at agriculture. Agriculture, uh, you know, when you think in terms of what a change in conditions can do as far as causing catastrophic loss of life, especially in poultry or fish. Then we have food service. Well, a data center may be dealing in, in billions of dollars a year to a small operator who owns two or three restaurant franchises. Losing your inventory is quite catastrophic as well. So critical loads can be, can be thought of as scalable. Then we have marine applications with bilge pumps, beacon lights. We have aggregates where a simple water pump failing or a conveyor belt that's misaligned or, or not, you know, or under duress causes a downtime condition. So all of these can be considered critical loads. Today, though, we're going to take a look at two ends of the spectrum. We're going to look at data centers. And we're going to take a look at agriculture and aquaculture. And because in my mind, this is the, the best way to illustrate how pervasive and how preventable downtime is across the board, no matter the technological spectrum. So what is a data center? We throw that word around. It can be as simple as your computer closet, but uh, a data center is essentially a building, a group of buildings, or a dedicated space that is used to house computer systems, 
primarily for data storage. Now, some of these are like Fort Knox. Some are more like, like I say, your, your uh, closet. But uh, data centers are huge. It is still a growing market, and it's expected to grow almost 5%. Uh, through 2026, and it's around a $104 billion market. So most prevalent and the ones that we touch the most are the, at banks and financial institutions, their industrial commercial, or the big data, like we know. You, know, you think of Amazon or, or Microsoft, and, uh, and, and there's your big data. So how are these delineated basically by tiers and what determines a tier in a data center one through four is really the level of redundancy data centers guarantee so for instance a tier four data center guarantees a 99.995 percent uptime annually that's 0.4 hours it's crazy. It's 2.4 minutes of downtime allowed per year. They must maintain a 96 hour power outage protection. The costs are great. And when one of these data centers fails, it can cost millions of dollars per hour. I said in the earlier slide, the average is $5,600 per minute but for a tier four, it's beyond catastrophic. It really is. And, and, and again, depending on the level of redundancy, tier three, tier two, a tier one still allows 28 hours of downtime per year with no redundancy. So, you know, that's, and a lot of it depends on the data center's customers, whether it's a, a self-supported data center or a company or if they are selling server space to other entities. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it. So a typical data center, uh, they're not all the same, but they're almost all the same. <laughs> the um, Much like a beehive where everything surrounds the queen bee, this is the, these are the servers, the server banks. And this area is known as the white space. And everything around this white space is there to support the uptime of this of the servers. That's it. That's the money maker. So you have different systems in, in play here. You have HVAC systems, which some are based on hot aisle containment. Some are based on uh, cold aisle. They're all different, but the idea is to keep the servers cool. They can run efficiently, they can run longer, they will consume less energy, and they will have fewer failures leading to downtime. The industry nomenclature of a crack or a cry unit, this is computer room air conditioner, computer room air handler. That's all it means. And it's essential that these things are operating. It's also essential when we look at the electrical room that all of the power is fed through a series of, of uninterruptible power supplies because that power has to be pristine. And our company also makes a host of products designed to not only measure the quantity of energy being provided to and, and consumed by a data center, but also the quality of that energy. Are you having power quality issues like, like over voltage, under voltage, are there harmonics at play? There's a lot that goes into it. So that side of it's very important as well. <clears throat> now, you remember the 96 hour guarantee for power outages. This is because of generator banks that we can guarantee this. Now, there's other technologies, uh, you know, and that's another whole discussion, but let's think in terms of, of an alternate energy source beyond the grid. And these generators, they have to come online quickly. They have to run at the, at the right frequency. They have to run for the right duration. So again, 
all of these subsystems go to support the server racks, the money makers. Uh, there's also security components. So a lot going on here in a data center and the, and the large mega data centers, the tier four, you can imagine what that's like. So let's break it down by space. Okay, we talked about the white space. That's where the server racks live. And server racks are provided power through PDUs or power distribution units. There's different philosophies on how those should be powered, but, and we'll touch on that. Now, these are critical load areas for the crack and cry units, the air handlers and air conditioners. Uh, these have to be operating and they have to be operating at all times. Also, there are fire suppression systems that have to be operable. These have to be monitored on a regular basis. These work in such a way that they're, they're gaseous, so they're not liquid-based, and they can extinguish a, a fire in a, in a, a server rack or somewhere in the, on the floor quickly without a loss of, with collateral damage. The other area in the white space is the secure access area, and that has to be maintained as well. Um, that industry refers to man traps, uh, security people will call these sally ports. It's basically a secure area where one door can't be opened unless the other one's closed. So these are three big areas in the white space. Now, when we look at the support areas, this is where we really have to take a, a hard look at a number of loads. In the electrical room where the energy meters will be installed is the switch gear. Also the generator and transfer switch. This is important and the systems that operate the generators and the transfer switches, they have their own test regimen. And But as I'll deal with later, our system will bring all of the individual vendors systems together, which becomes a, uh, a concentrator, if you will. Another area in the, in the battery portion that are part of the standby power, there's a fume extractor system. And if this fume extraction system fails to operate uh, quickly, a, a strong buildup of hydrogen occurs. So it's a real problem. In the UPS system, again, these have their own self-monitoring checks, but we provide a level of redundancy and we bring those into one system. Any of these loads can bring your data center down, any of them, if they fail. Mechanical rooms have your air conditioning units, your air handling. With that, there's centrifugal pumps. There's uh, for, for moving chilled water. And so this is very important. Again, the servers have to be kept cool, as cool as possible. Typically outside, there's a cooling plant that's feeding the mechanical room and feeding the, the, the uh, white space areas. And you either have cooling towers with water-cooled chillers or you have air-cooled chillers with no cooling towers. Either way, you're gonna have condenser pumps and chilled water pumps. Again, any of these loads will cause potential failures in your data center and unscheduled downtime. So they need to be monitored. So let's look at the electrical part of it uh, with the PDU, again, power distribution units. Uh, you have multiple servers on the floor. And the idea, uh, one school of thought is to monitor the branch circuits and the way we approach the monitoring of the branch circuits is we have a, a product, the WM50, the part number may or may not mean anything to you, but it's basically for monitoring up to 96 branch circuits in a single device. We have a high density uh, current transformer that, that locks around, it clamps around the uh, individual conductors and it will do um, 
uh, three phase or it will do 96 individual uh, single phase. Most are single phase circuits unless they're coming from the mains or a power distribution panel. It's uh, the benefit of this is that it communicates with our uh, head end product and so all of this data becomes readily available to just about any other device or software platform that needs it and the installation and commissioning time is proven to be up to 75 percent less than a traditional energy meter with individual current transformers. The other side of thinking uses power bus bars at the power distribution units. We have a solution for that as well. We use a transducer. There's no reason to have a device with a display at each drop. Uh, in this illustration, we're showing the ET272 transducer. It's like an energy meter without a display. And from the, uh, from the mains, we are feeding individual server racks, server rack, server rack. And these can be daisy chained. Uh, the ET272 uh, uses uh, small, compact, uh, ganged current transformers, pulls the data, is able to provide the data back to uh, uh, one of our UWP, which is our head end unit. So this is the other thinking. So you're either doing uh, multiple circuits or you're doing a bus bar. And we have solutions developed and in use in this industry today successfully for these applications. So back to the point of this presentation, critical loads, it's such a potentially devastating issue, but it's a very easy uh, one to fix. And, and I think we have an elegant solution. Uh, Carlo Gavazzi has an entire family of current sensing devices. This one I've, I've shown on the right is our newest, the EISH. It'll be released this month. And most of these have the current transformers built in. Uh, some are adjustable, some are auto ranging, but the idea is that the critical loads actually pass their, their um, uh, power cable through the built-in CT. And if that load fails, the contacts change state and the signal is sent. It is that simple. And these can be installed just in about any type of application. And they can, they'll work with, with our system. We do a complete turnkey. But also, if there's other systems like PLCs or microprocessor based, we work with those just as well. So let's look at the other part of our system. We know the devices, but also everything needs a head end. Everything needs a main control. And we adopted the Universal Web Platform or UWP. Uh, we're in iteration 3.0 now, but this product is used for so many things. We use it in parking, we use it in building automation, we use it for energy. But what it is, it's a Linux PC. It's a gateway for BACnet, for Modbus TCP IP, for a variety of things. It's also a controller. This product will execute logic. It will also, it has some wizardry built into where you can you can take analog inputs and scale them uh, for temperature, for pressure. It has digital I.O. It has, it has a lot going on. It's also an edge controller. So with the MQTT part of it, uh, you can immediately uh, communicate on the edge, sending things to the fog and to the cloud without an additional piece of hardware and without an additional vendor. It's built in as a web server, a web service, built-in data logger, and includes a REST API. So all of this can be used with third-party products, 
It can also be used with, uh, say, to make smartphone apps. It's really nice. But this is our head end. The, uh, the three devices, they're all interconnected through a high-speed bus that has terminals in the uh, sides of the units. But you have the main controller. You have the what we call a master channel generator, which is a network controller. And then you have the ability to add things like modems. Uh, we now have a, a lower one gateway. It's subject of another of another uh, discussion. And with the built-in web server, it has uh, complete data logging capabilities with a user configurable graphical user interface. So you can make your own display screens for your data, and you can access this device through any common web browser. So the UW3 is a, is a great front end. So let's break it down in a more of a graphic here. When I think of data centers, I'm thinking about cooling, I'm thinking about ventilation, and the simple way to do that is to bring your critical loads, whether they're pumps, air handlers, battery room fume extractors, whatever, through the CTs of our current sensing device and bring these into our field bus I.O., which communicates directly with our gateway controller. Now, this same controller concurrently will handle up to 128 energy meters over uh, RS-485. That's on a single controller. These controllers are networkable. Literally thousands and thousands of I.O. points, whether they're critical or they're just in need of control and monitoring. Now this small, and I hope it shows well enough uh, where you can see it, but the UWP web platform, it's communicating Modbus TCP IP with other UWPs. They have different control uh, schemes happening, and each of these can support up to seven individual networks, each UWP. Then I mentioned it's, it's completely, uh, it's an edge controller. It is uh, uh, Microsoft Azure certified. It is self-certified Amazon AWS, has API, has several file transfer protocols built in. It's really a, a, a standalone system. But the idea is that you easily and economically can monitor the status of loads. To show a contrast to data centers, which are arguably one of the, on the higher end of the technology spectrum, I wanted to look at, for the greatest contrast, agriculture and aquaculture, because those are huge markets and the vulnerabilities presented by critical load failure in those two areas are just as impactful. So. If you eat tilapia, there you go. It's probably raised in a farm in Mississippi somewhere, but uh, they, um, uh, they're quite good for the farmers, but uh, there's some things that can really turn disastrous. So why aquaculture? Why look at this? Well, one, it's, it's a fairly large market. It's $1.5 billion. It is growing at 6%, and the United States... Uh, still owns the lion's share of this market. Uh, there is obviously, like anything, there's there's an encroachment from Southeast Asia and, and things, but uh, typically the largest growth potential is in the catfish segment, and that's squarely here in the United States. So what can happen in a fish farm? It's a lot more than just, you know, building some ponds and placing some fish. Um, one, the fish have to be economically raised, which means that you need to bring them to market as quickly as possible. And they have to be healthy. They have to pass USDA inspection. Now, a typical fish farm will have anywhere from 15 to 30 ponds. Uh, they're typically uh, one acre. And a yield is about $100,000 
in catfish each time you pull or use a seine net to bring the pond. But things can happen to have a very rapid catastrophic kill to all of your fish in the pond. And that's dealing with dissolved oxygen concentrations. Now, it, that's all driven by the amount of phytoplankton, the amount of fertilizer, the soil composition. There's a lot of things that impact this. But once it drops below five milligrams per liter, the fish start to stress. They stop eating, they stop growing. And when, when this happens, in a perfect world, a signal is sent and these aerator devices that you see on the right side of the screen churn the water. They, they aerate by, by cavitation. However, these are in, they sit out 12 months out of the year in all weather. Um, they are prone to failure. They get, say, water in the fuel. They have spark plug issues. Long story short, if the aerators fail, you can have a rapid depletion of dissolved oxygen. And once the DO falls below two milligrams per liter, you are in serious jeopardy of a rapid fish kill. And when that happens, you have to drain the pond, you have to subject it to UV light for several months, you lose all of that revenue, not only from the fish, from the stock that was killed, but in the potential of raising new groups of fish. So aeration is a big issue. The other, and it's a little bit more obtuse than just aeration, is pH monitoring. Now an optimum pH level is between 6.5 to 7.5 for the fish. They are healthier and they will eat more. You want the fish to really eat. If it falls more to the uh, acidic side at four to six or uh, to the alkaline side, 911, outside of that 6.5 to 7.5, the fish won't die, but they're sluggish and you have to keep feeding the fish and they're not growing. So you have the food cost. It's important to monitor the pH because once it moves past 11, it's invariably fatal to the fish. So the same outcome that you had with aeration. Now, pH, there are pH monitoring systems on the market. Uh, they're good, but they're instrument grade. And these are industrial grade applications. So they're also prone to failure. Uh, our recommendation is to uh, have a redundant system where you physically bring the pH monitoring into the Carlo Gavazzi UWP through analog inputs. So now you have a redundant system. The, uh, the idea is to, uh, again, raise healthy fish for the, in the least amount of time for the least cost in food. So, so what does this look like? Okay, again, there's our uh, ubiquitous current sensing devices and we have our critical loads we have aerators in each pond and there may be up to five in each pond but I just show one for this graphic pond one pond two pond three so all of these loads are brought back to a to a digital field bus IO module takes inputs takes multiple inputs now for the pH we have a standard pH probe that's feeding a 4 to 20 signal to one of our analog input modules. This is brought back to the UWP front end, and in the UWP, it's able to work and scale with the analog signals coming in from the pH. Alarms can be set, notifications can be sent. Added to the gateway controller is our 4G modem. So this modem can communicate with the growers. It can communicate with the home office or really anybody else that needs to mitigate this situation, which there's a whole, depending on if it's too alkaline or, or too acid, there's different remedies for that. And again, we have the same abilities to work directly with multiple ponds, multiple systems, and to place everything comfortably on the cloud. So fish farming is 
it's a growing industry, but I used it because it, it, it shows immediately the pain of critical load failure. Along that same vein is, a, is an enormous industry, both in this country and globally. In fact, poultry farming, industrial poultry farming, I'm not really talking about somebody with uh, urban chickens. This is, this is big time, and each of these houses will grow about 30,000 birds it, uh, individually each time. So it's a big operation and they are quite vulnerable. Uh, poultry birds are not exactly the most robust animals. They're not always the brightest. They will stand out in the rain till they drown, but it's neither here nor there. Now, it's a $405 billion market globally. I mean, that's huge. And I pulled a, a study done, a joint study by Alabama A&M and Auburn University. And I was absolutely blown away. When we talk about catastrophic bird losses, that's where something happens and all the bird in your house dies. So 30,000 birds, okay. 45% were found to be due to generator and automatic transfer switch failure. 45%, that, I, I, it's just mind blowing to me. 10% because the controller and the backup system failed. Okay, another 14% because the fail-safe alarm system failed. That's even more unbelievable. 69% of the catastrophic bird losses, according to this university study, could have been prevented with a critical load monitoring solution. So what are the critical loads in a, in a grow house, if you will? You see these nice fans. We have uh, fans to stir the air, we have fans to move the heat, but ventilation fans are how they regulate the temperature in a grow house. There's no way to really air condition it. And without ventilation, the birds can die, and if it goes on for too awful long, they probably will die. Now, the other part of the equation is that they regulate uh, the static pressure using a system of fans and louvers, they want a slight negative pressure that draws air in into the into the grow house without having to use you know uh, uh, additional inductive loads. Now, in addition to temperature regulation, the exhaust fans are are necessary to to remove the buildup of ammonia. There's 20 to 30 thousand birds in these houses, and without constant exhausting you can imagine what the atmosphere would, would be like. So the other primary critical load are the gen sets. And again, I pull this 45% number up again, that just still blows my mind. So when you think about critical loads that can cause enormous losses of money, loss of livestock, you have to think in terms of, of monitoring these critical loads. I, uh, I present a graphic here from Chore Time Equipment, one of our customers, and they, uh, they show a nice artist rendering of, of the different inlets and fans and lighting functions. We haven't even touched on what a problem in the food and water distribution can do. Now, this is the artist rendering. This is reality. These are harsh environments. They have a, a terrible atmosphere. Uh, there's dust and mites and mold and, and feathers and it's it's really uh, anytime you take 30,000 of anything and shove them into a building it's going to be a problem. So all of these are extremely vital uh, systems. They all have to work for the health of the birds and to prevent catastrophic loss. So how do we approach that? Well again our critical loads we have ventilation fans and there may be you know, a dozen of these in a house. You have fans to keep the air moving. Then we have the generators. And here, not only is a load monitor important to see is the generator running when it's supposed to be, but one of the primary causes of generator failure is that the batteries are allowed to die. And a simple DC single phase voltage monitor can remedy that problem. And I've brought one in here to monitor the, the generator battery. 
Now, in a perfect world, generators should automatically start once a week and run for a prescribed amount of time to charge the batteries. But that's not reality sometimes. So by monitoring this, we can send a signal back through our field bus, back to the main controller that simply sends an alarm and a message that says, your generator battery needs to be attended to, simple. Also, with our analog capabilities, we are going to monitor relative humidity, which is an important variable, temperature, almost as a runaway, and static pressure, which are all scalable inside of our controller. So, very simple approach. It's a mix of very low-tech, but very high-end when you start to look at the, uh, and think about how easily we can take a simple operation like a poultry grow house or a catfish pond, and we can actually enable it for the cloud and for data logging and for a much larger enterprise-wide concern. Something I didn't say enough about. I love it when it's an all Carlo Gavazzi system, of course, but there is a, a multitude of different programmable logic controllers from companies all over the world. There's dedicated microcontrollers, and there's a variety of different protocols that are in use. We work with all of these. So our critical load monitoring solution will work just as easily with a third-party product as it will with ours. So we like to think we're a bit chameleon-esque in that sense. But I think it, it really needed to be said because, um, you know, uh, connectability is everything today. So just kind of tying this up, we talked about what makes a load a critical load and the costs associated with it. It can be not only expensive in terms of money, lost revenue, but also in terms of loss of livestock too and, and, and life. Um, we presented an entirely two different ends of the spectrum. And, and you could even take this farther. It might not be data center caliber, but if you're a small franchisee and you own a series of ice cream shops and your freezer goes out, you'd probably want to know it. Uh, so it's, it's very scalable. And no matter the industry, no matter the application, they all have critical loads that should be monitored. Uh, as far as I know, we're the only company that can do a complete solution. We can take it from the sensor all the way through the cloud, we, front to back. Same vendor, same protocol, same everything. So we are very proud of that, and I think that's a real benefit for us. So we want you to learn more. There's only so much we can present here in a, in a half an hour. You know, this was uh, pretty much an introduction to our solutions for critical load management. However, we have a tremendous amount of information at our website, on the web in general, and I will send everyone a copy of this, of this uh, presentation. But we have some awesome videos that show our energy management solution in the data centers, uh, the main current switch we've been talking about, the UWP, the WM13, which is uh, WM15. We also uh, author white papers that take a look at specific applications and issues and how to solve them. And we, of course, have brochures. So uh, you'll have links to all of these. And again, I greatly appreciate your time today, and I hope it was beneficial for you. It was for me. And I appreciate all Jim's help in getting this uh, set up and, and uh, uh, being a co-host, if you will. So um, thank you very much.